Hey, I'm at um, Oscar Grant Plaza. There's a little bit of um, Occupy Oakland going on, as usual. Uh, and um, there is a press conference happening. So we're heading over to the press conference. Just a minute ago, someone spotted a colonel from the Department, I mean, yeah, the Department of Homeland Security. So that's kind of interesting. And okay, the press conference is starting. This press conference is about pre uh, the brutality by the police against peaceful demonstrators this weekend. Um, several of the people who were beat are here, and the National Lawyers Guild. One of them is actually a veteran, I believe. On January 28th, thousands of people responded to Occupy Oakland's call for a mass mobilization to occupy a vacant building to transform it into a new housing for citizens. Occupy Oakland's new home is to be a social center, open to all who want to participate and be produced. We plan to work together as we did at Austin Grant Plaza to provide free food, housing, medical care, space for children, space for women and queers, and most importantly, a community. The entire plan to take over a building was kept a secret in order to avoid conflict with the police. So the plan would allow people who wanted to stay away from the to do so. Only people who are committed to facing police violence and arrest, knowing the risk, would stay in the building. The last thing we wanted was for hundreds of people to be assaulted and arrested, but that seems to be the OPD's priority in order to protect an unused, abandoned building. We were met with a massive police response, including tear gas, flashbang grenades, less lethal rounds, and wanton baton strikes. The city, which continues to close libraries and schools and lay off city workers, spent thousands of dollars to violently suppress Occupy Oakland from transforming an unused, city-owned building into a socially useful space. In excess of $3 million of taxpayer money was spent to oppress Occupy Oakland so far, the city seems to have no intention of halting its costly and brutal efforts. Despite the police aggression, close to a thousand people regrouped at Oscar Grant Plaza and marched through downtown. The police trapped us in a vacant lot at 19th and Telegraph, and tear gas us once again. After escaping the kettle, the march continued a few blocks north before hundreds were trapped in front of the YMCA and arrested with no dispersal order. By the end of the evening, close to 400 protesters had been arrested in Oakland. The vast majority was unfolding charges that would most likely be dropped. Despite police and city officials' attempt to criminalize and smear Occupy Oakland, the movement retains high levels of support. Um, the fact that several thousand people participated in the move-in day evidence of the continuing support for Occupy Oakland. Cars honked in support, people waved from windows, um, and residents passed out water to gas and exhausted protesters. Solidarity demonstrations were held in nearly 30 cities, organized by Occupy Wall Street, Boston, Chicago, and others. As marchers were released throughout the weekend, stories of police misconduct emerged. Elisa Einsberg, an Occupy Oakland activist who suffered from multiple sclerosis, was denied her medication while being detained. At least two other people who asked for medication weren't given it, she said. One woman had her cuffs so tight that her hands were turning blue and she was crying. The way they treated us is exactly why I'm involved in Occupy Oakland, I never said. Other protesters recently released from jail report similar widespread abuses. Detained protesters were kept in painful zip tie handcuffs from sometimes from eight to 12 hours and not allowed access to bathrooms and were not given medical or illnesses, including someone suffering from HIV and another from a kidney conviction. Those processed in Santa Rita have complained of being kept in folding areas designed for a fraction of their number, inappropriate areas like shower rooms, and of being harassed. This treatment is symptomatic of the treatment of the Oakland Police Department <coughs> and reflects a broader issue of police violence and brutality experienced by the people of Oakland every day. These acts follow the Kwan administration's attempt to gain the judicial system and use it to cycle freedom and expression with stay away orders and by piling on and reopening charges for protesters. Occupy Oakland and the people of Oakland in the Bay Area will not be intimidated into silence and passivity by the violence and repression against us. These acts only strengthen our resolve 
and should be a clarion call to all people who value free speech, assembly, and change in this city. Occupy Oakland continues to plan demonstrations and actions that defend the interests of working people against the repression and greed of the 1%. On Sunday, January 29th, the day after the police attacks and arrests, Occupy Oakland's General Assembly voted to hold a rally against police repression on Monday, February 6th, and endorsed the call for the May 1st International General Strike. What is your name, ma'am? Maria Lewis. Maria Lewis? L-E-W-I-S? Yes. Can you spell your last name? L-E-W-I-S. Maria Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. Hello, uh, my name is Karen Hancock. That's K-A-R-E-N-H-A-N-C-O-C-K. I am 63 years old. Karen I live Hancock. in Oakland. Oakland is my home. And I want to just make a couple of comments directed to Mayor Kwan and Governor Brown, and that is this. The first one is this. Occupy, the Occupy movement and Occupy Oakland is not made up just of young people. It is made up of people of all ages and all walks of life. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. I'm a part of it. I would like them to get clear on that. My second comment is about the violence that the mayor is attributing to our movement. It is not coming from the Occupy movement. In Oakland, it comes from the police department. I was, I saw it firsthand. I was arrested Saturday evening, and I saw many instances of cruelty from what appeared to be robotic monsters type people with batons waving and hitting people. So I wanted to make those comments of my own. Now I want to read a statement from one of Oakland's teachers who couldn't be here today. Her name is Tess, T-E-S-S, -S, Unger, U-N-G-E-R. As I'm sure many of you hadn't heard from the recent mainstream media highlights, the Children's Village and Parents and Allies Caucus of Occupy Oakland marched in solidarity with the move-in move day. There were a good number of parents in attendance who hold a deep belief in a better world for their children and wanted to participate in the day's events. Predicting what, that police violence was possible, we planned to march with the group to a point and then peel off to have a picnic in a park at Laney College, across the street from the Kaiser Center. The march began in the plaza with thousands of people, balloons, and colorful banners. A brass orchestra played in front of us. The sun was shining, and children made up their own protest chants. A few blocks in, we noticed a long line of police moving in our direction. It should be noted that the position of the Children's March at the back of the line was strategic. Everyone figured that if the police were to respond to us violently, having our most vulnerable members march in the back with easy exits was necessary. Also, keep in mind that there was no reason for the police to respond to us violently, but I digress. OPD kettled us in, and within minutes, several children were upset. Responding to their concerns, we moved to the sidewalk to check in with families. As we did, the police closed in the kettle, so we had no exit. One officer, after being asked several times to please let the kids through, stepped aside and let people with children out, blocks away from the building's destination. We walked on to our picnic spot on the Laney campus and for the rest of the day sang songs and fed ducks and played. All the while, a war zone was unfolding just yards away. Well-intentioned comrades sent texts and let us know that the children should stay away from what was happening in the streets, that the police were firing tear gas and projectiles without restraint. 
i hoped fervently that the families who stayed with the march were away from the chaos and that the kids were safe i've seen the news reports and read plenty about january twenty j twenty eight in the last few days people want to focus entirely on the destruction of property as the central issue here people want to direct everyone's attention to a burned flag and torn fences and broken windows i want it to be known that the first conversation everyone should be having is about the brutality and abuse of power of the OPD on January 28th. We all need to be studying the live streams, not the conveniently edited mainstream news feeds and asking ourselves why? Why do we accept this as an expected police reaction? What kind of society are we upholding? Why do we passively enable a military-like response to loud voices and a refusal to back down? These were unarmed civilians with shields. Shields made to protect themselves, not to destroy the police. We didn't have weapons, and water bottles and small rocks do not equal tear gas and flash grenades especially against drones in riot gear. And now I would like to speak directly to the officers in attendance on January 28th. I would call you the Oakland Police Department, but not many of you, but not many of you live in this beautiful, dynamic and soulful city, so it doesn't feel quite appropriate. And of course, many of you were called in from outlying cities to help OPD handle the unarmed protesters. I want to believe that underneath those ridiculous war suits, you are human. I want to believe that you can look at this mess of a system and see flaws and understand why many of us are doing this. I want to believe that you know that redemption doesn't happen in locked up, in lockup and that righteousness is not born from abuse. I want to believe that you have children, that you tuck them into bed and kiss their foreheads and imagine a better world than this one. I want to think that you would never want them to be shot at for using their voices, for standing up for themselves and their, for their friends and for their families. A few months ago, I reassured people that you would never attack without warning. I really believed that you checked first for kids before you arrested people and beat them with sticks, before you fired tear gas into a crowd. I want to believe that you thought about it. Did you check on Saturday when those homemade shields appeared to give you license to unload your rage? Did you know who was behind them? When you hit Scott Olson in the head in October, did you know for certain that you wouldn't be hitting a child? Would it have made a difference? I am here unapologetically in this global effort to balance the scales. Saturday's events, though traumatizing for many of us, will ultimately strengthen our resolve. We have made mistakes, and I assure you that we will learn from them. But we are growing and evolving, and we are not going anywhere. In just a few months, we have started to build something that will change the course of history. Amen. And we will fight. We will each fight in our own way to protect it. My loved ones have been plucked up and locked up and beat up with blatant disregard for their God-given right to do just exactly what they are doing, speaking, calling it like they see it unveiling things that need to stop hiding, caring for each other, providing cap proving capable of living, breathing democracy. Thank you. My name is Caitlin Manning, C-A-I-T-L-I-N-M-A-N-N-I-N-G. First, I would like to say shame on everybody who blamed us for the violence that happened on Friday. Equating 
a broken city model and a broken vending machine with the incredible intensity and the barrage of violence that hit us is absolutely ludicrous. Instead, I would ask you to note that despite hours and hours of being brutalized by the police, not a single window in Oakland was broken. Nobody has mentioned that. That's an outrage that nobody has even mentioned that and we continue to be blamed for what happened to us. I'm now going to read, I'm a university professor and filmmaker and I have a dear friend, Joshua Clover, also a university professor who was arrested on Friday and I'm going to read his statement. He was unable to be here today. This is a statement from Joshua Clover, J-O-S-H-U-A-C-L-O-V-E-R. I was in custody in the county of Alameda from Saturday to Monday night. My experience at Santa Rita Jail was trivial compared to the many women and men locked up as part of a broad practice of political and economic discipline that is being increasingly recognized around the world as being unusually and increasingly brutal and systematic, such that U.S. prisons now lag behind a broad sampling of nations in matters of human rights. My experience was also not as severe as several others incarcerated with me. I was not beaten. Three people I know were denied medication for HIV infections while being held for multiple days, which is a life-threatening choice made by the county. This was part of a wider practice while we were there of denying services required by law. Let me say briefly what I did experience. I was held for 53 hours for a misdemeanor charge, which every single person here and there knows will never be brought and indeed which will be met with a class action suit for wrongful arrest that the city of Oakland will be compelled to settle. I have a perforated peptic ulcer. Early on in the stay, I requested non-prescription care, liquid antacid, which the jail keeps on hand when I began to have an ulcer attack, which is to say when I began to bleed internally. I was not given such care until an attorney was able to intervene by phone many hours later. I received one capsule, which was mildly affected for about three hours. Further requests were ignored. As many will know, a bleeding ulcer attack is both painful and potentially fatal. During that period, I was moved from cell to cell seven times for a total of eight different cell visits. My attorney came to the jail and was not allowed to see me. She was told I hadn't been processed yet, which was not the case. Food was often not provided for periods of up to 14 hours. For a long period, I shared a cell with 27 other people. It was about 10 feet by 10 feet. For a period, I was in the cell labeled maximum occupancy two. There were 10 of us, three very sick. We stood. One of the people slumped over on the toilet, that being the alternative to standing. But the cell in which I spent the longest time was a drunk tank looking out onto the jail's intake office, its processing area, and its document table. Which is to say that while I waited by the door, hoping to speak with a guard about medication, hoping that the pain might be eased and the internal bleeding slowed, I had considerable opportunity to watch the intake and booking operations and the larger workflow of the processing operation. There were repeated periods, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, in which the deputies and other workers at Santa Rita Jail simply chose not to process anyone through the system. The three fingerprinting machines stood idle. The intake windows didn't operate. The prisoner files sat on the table. All this time, hundreds of people who will obviously prove to have been falsely arrested, all of them hungry, some very sick, with families and loved ones and jobs, sat in cells filled well past double the legal occupancy. Empty cells were clearly visible. There were no ongoing complications happening elsewhere. I could see the employees. They were sitting there. Sometimes they had coffee. Occasionally they left their post to go to the bathroom. Small groups of people were released every couple of hours. I would estimate that even an indifferent and minimally capable set of deputies, and who could expect more from them, could process perhaps 40 people an hour. A clear choice was made not to do so. Perhaps these employees are aware that they serve a corrupt and dangerous institution in service, and even if they have internalized its values, its racism and sexism and homophobia and its generalized brutality, they are trying to destroy it from within by intentionally incompetent labor. It is not a terrible strategy. But I encourage them, if that is the case, to have the courage of their convictions rather than the habitual cowardice of bullies which marks them like a gang tattoo, and take the task of destroying the jails more seriously. Many of my friends and many unknown comrades have a limited amount of time. Hi, my name is Noah Zimmerman. It's N-O-A-H-Z-I-M-M-E-R-M-A-N. I was arrested on Friday, September 
arrested on January 28th at the YMCA Kettle. Do you remember? I was born and raised in Oakland on 61st and Pelagos. I'm a Richmond resident now. And I just want to say that the idea that only a certain percentage of people arrested are from Oakland is insulting. It's my intelligence and your intelligence. I'm an East Bay resident. I'm a Bay Area native. And I learned that most of the police and even some of the city leaders don't live in Oakland, such as Deanna Santana, I believe. My experience in jail, as has been previously said, is trivial compared to the number of people who are in jails and prisons. I've learned that in terms of absolute numbers, not as a percentage, but in absolute numbers, the United States has more people incarcerated than China and under the gulag system under Stalin. And I just want you to think about that for a second and let that settle in. I was held in Tank 10 along with 26 other men. There were empty cells I could see across the hall that were not used. One man, apparently with a psychiatric problem, was put into a cell alone. And this is the most heartbreaking thing that I saw that night. He held up a sign made out of cardboard with mayonnaise that said, please don't let them hurt me. This went on for about 24 hours until I was released. We weren't allowed to make a phone call to a lawyer for 16 hours. The police were, or the sheriff's deputies were verbally abusive. At one point, I asked for the time and the deputy flew into a rage that I had the nerve to ask what time it was. Let me see. There is another person that we heard through the grapevine had HIV who was denied medication. As we all know, HIV is a life-threatening illness. And that medication was denied until we started a chant asking the deputies to get his medication. There was, it seemed like it was absolute chaos in Santa Rita. A deputy told me that a normal Saturday night, they expect 100 people. And I believe 338 occupiers were arrested that night. And this morning I learned through NBC and CBS that these charges have been dropped except for 10 felonies. So these are your tax dollars at work and mine. A complete waste of money. And obviously the class action lawsuit that's coming will cost the county even more money and the city of Oakland. I'm appalled at the way that we were treated. I think it speaks volumes about this paramilitarized police force that we've all become accustomed to since September 11th. And this idea that cops who are dressed for war, dressed for war with modified shotguns, with batons, with drones overhead, with armor, with black helmets, who look like something out of a science fiction movie, something out of THX 1138. It's frightening to me that this is the new normal in the United States in 2012. I don't know what to say. And this speaks to the National Defense Authorization Act, which suspended habeas corpus, which Obama signed on New Year's Eve under the cover of darkness. At least Abraham Lincoln had the guts to say he was suspending habeas corpus in plain English. Obama does not have that, can't say that. And this is just, I don't know what to say. This has to stop. And the solidarity marches, the 26 other cities were inspiring to me. And I think everybody knows that we're not going to stop. So thank you. Hello, how you doing? My name is Shake Anderson, S-H-A-K-E-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. Shake Anderson, S-H-A-K-E-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. I've been a third generation resident of Oakland, California. Also, I served seven years in the military. I actually worked on the base of Pensacola, Florida as security. And I have a relationship with understanding of what police work really is. So let's actually talk about police work. If somebody calls and there's a problem, if someone gets robbed, they need to fill a report so the police can actually do their job. Police work isn't hurting people. 
that's it's not their job to actually wear in military form and actually hurt people. That's the job of the U.S. military for whatever reason I don't know when they go overseas to do what they have to do. This is we're in Oakland, California. These are Oakland citizens and residents. These people didn't come out here to attack or to confront police. They came out here to peacefully protest in a country that gives you the right to do so. That's what they came out here to do. They didn't attack or provoke the police. I was on 19th and Telegraph when it was kettled, when we when they kettled us. They, they said disperse, but they gave us no exit. They said disperse, but they gave us no exit. So 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 when people tried to exit, then they started with tear gas, which disorient. Being that I was in the military, when you fire any weapon, it disorients the people. So therefore they get nervous and they get scared. Then they started to move in closer, which makes them even more afraid. So then the people decided to knock down a fence to escape. And that's what we did. But my question is, why would we have to escape from our own police force? Police work is when we need help, when we need services, when we need paramedics, when we need help when something happens, when some violence in the community, that's what they're here to do, to protect the people. All I saw from the police was them hurting people. They were trying to create conditions to make it unsafe for people to have use their constitutional rights, and that's the protest of America. They, they, when they arrest the people, when they arrest people and they send them to Santa Rita for, for misdemeanor charges, what they're doing is dehumanizing us. And that's what's been going on throughout the country. We've been dehumanized. We've been dehumanized, meaning they take away our rights. Can you repeat that again? I'm sorry. That's what happens in America in, when they go to Santa Rita for misdemeanor charges. They are dehumanizing us. They are trying to break their spirits and to remind us that we have no rights in the country in which we say we do. We have the right for, uh, of assembly. We have the right of freedom of speech. These are things that we have voted on in our constitution that we're supposed to uphold. And the people are upholding it in the powers that be, the people that uh, give these orders to the police officers, they are not withholding their constitutional rights. Their officers, Mayor Kwan, I would like to say this definitely about Mayor Kwan. That in her response to calling Occupy, every single person to Occupy is a leader. It's a leadership, leaderless movement. That means when we speak, we speak for ourselves and for the people that agree with us. That's what Occupy is. So when, we, when you say we're going to call the other Occupy to denounce Oakland, we are Occupy movement. They are us. You can't have one without the other. You can't have a peaceful protest and a protest without validation through the general assembly process and the validation of people. We don't make anybody come march. It's a, it's a free will choice. This is the choice we have in America to do something to stand up for our rights. And we're being violated on our rights on a daily basis, and it shows by the police repression and the violence. There's a difference between violence. I think the definition of violence needs to be clear. Violence is when you, when you hurt someone physically, hurt their person, break something, spray them with pepper gas, hit them with tear gas, shoot them in the face with rubber bullets. That's called violence. <coughs> Breaking a window is not violence. Breaking something is not violence. That's the destruction of property, but it's not violence against a person. We need to value humanity. This is not. This is about human rights, not property rights. We, the property is insured. It, it, it is not a person. It doesn't go to the hospital when you break a window. When you break someone's arm, they have to go to the hospital. We have to take care of the people in our world and the humans that we are amongst to us. And the system is not doing that on every level, from healthcare to unemployment. To every level, they are denying human basic rights. We were feeding thousands of people a day when this camp was up and going, when the Occupy movement first came to Oakland, California. And in the third week, we dropped crime 19%. That was leaked by Channel 2, thank you very much. It was uh, 19%. They withheld that because it was adverse against what they were trying to campaign to say we caused crime. And so they destroyed the camp as soon as they could so they could hold on to that number so somebody could use it to get reelected. That's my theory. So my point is, this is not about playing the movement for politics. This is about people and human rights, and we need to identify that, and we need to continue to fight, we need to continue to struggle, and continue to push this movement because it's for human rights throughout the world. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Before I next speaker, I just want to make a very quick comment about the ludicrous letter by Mayor Kwan to other Occupy leaders uh, calling on them to condemn Oakland. Uh, Okay. Several, uh, sev uh, several other occupiers, including uh, Occupy Wall Street, have already sent in letters uh, denouncing the city and police repression on January 28th. It's highly unlikely that uh, 
that that ridiculous appeal will will be you know responded to by anybody. What's your reaction that she's made Chief Jordan permanent? We're gonna um finish up with our our speaker list here. Thank you, Angel. Hi, my name is Angel A N G E L Castellon C A S T E L L O N, and I am 19 years old. I am a student at Laney College and an activist at in Occupy Oakland. I was arrested for the first time outside of y outside of the YMCA. I was with my mother, who is 48, and my partner. <laughs> I'm out here to say that it, that we are unstoppable, and another world is possible. Even uh, sorry. I was detained for 51 hours, and my most frightening experience in jail was being isolated in a holding cell by myself. When I asked the when I asked the officer why I was being held by myself and detained after being booked and said I was being recited, he threatened me, saying this was my fault, I deserve to be here. And he also said that I was going to get another day just for asking why I was here after being booked and told I was going to be cited and released. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah. My name is Carrie Lamprex, C-A-R-E-Y-L-A-M-P-R-E-C-H-T. Say that one more time, please. L-A-M-P-R-E-C-H-T, Carrie, C-A-R-E-Y. I'm a paralegal with the National Lawyers Guild, and I'm here on behalf of Occupy Legal for the Bay Area. Um, according to our records, Saturday evening and into Sunday and over the week, there was over 350 arrests of uh, protests in downtown Oakland. The police numbers reflect a little more, about 402, last we checked. Three to 400 protesters were arrested without probable cause um, to believe that they had committed any crime. The Fourth Amendment requires that the police have probable cause for each person they arrest. This is not the case Saturday night. Police in Oakland continue to violate free speech rights, use excessive force, and make, make baseless arrests. This is despite the fact OPD has been given a consent decree for nine years and has agreed to a crowd control policy uh, that was formed under a civil lawsuit. They continue to defy this crowd control policy and now are facing multiple lawsuits. Oakland Police Department's misconduct has cost the city of Oakland millions and millions of dollars to this point and will continue to do so. They hire hundreds of officers to squash people's free, right, free speech rights and continue to violate their ability to express their constitutional right to free speech. Examples that you've heard today include, um, we, we have reports of a man who had a baton to his face causing his teeth to be knocked out. They shot tear gas, concussion grenades, and rubber bullets directly at protesters on Saturday throughout the day and into the evening. There were reports of bicycles being thrown at protesters by officers. Uh, people being thrown downstairs, and in one reported case, through a glass door. People were not allowed a way to disperse in contained areas and were tear gassed. The arrestees were then held for hours in buses without access to bathrooms, water, food, and some of them with chemical agents on them still. Quite often, handcuffs were too tight and caused injuries to people's hands. The jail conditions were deplorable. The overcrowding was inhumane as people were held 20 to 30 to a cell in showers and other inadequate spaces. Worst of all, many were booked days after the arrest. Some were unaccountable after two days inside or more. Many people were denied access to our attorneys and counsel. Then in the courts, as we're seeing the cases come down, we have seen the DA 
request stay away orders from this plaza, Frank Ogawa, Oscar Grant Plaza, in uh, the amount of 300 yards. Despite these facts, the, the fact that these arrests occurred elsewhere than this plaza, this is clearly unconstitutional and we aim to challenge that. Oakland Police Department and Alameda County Sheriff must, must answer to these egregious abuses and misconduct. People in custody were denied medication for serious conditions such as multiple sclerosis, HIV, bleeding ulcers, mental health issues resulting in folks going into crises in their cells and being denied access to counsel despite these problems. The National Lawyers Guild and Occupy Legal call upon the City of Oakland, the Oakland Police Department, and the Alameda Sheriff's Department to end its abuses against people in Oakland that are expressing their constitutional rights. These constitutional rights are protected by our Constitution, and we call upon them to cease their excessive force that's costing the City of Oakland millions of dollars. Thank you very much. Can you follow up a little bit on uh, you know, the legal uh, we'll uh, opinion on the uh, stay away we'll order? I'd like to answer the questions later. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Sri Louise, and I'm a member of the Interfaith Ten. My name is Sri Louise, and I'm a member of the Interfaith Ten at Oakland. And if I become emotional and I begin to shake. These are the symptoms of someone in post-traumatic stress. In 2003, I was shot in the face with a non-lethal projectile by the OPD. The OPD are a murderous cancer in the city of Oakland. Yeah, yeah. On Saturday, I was part of the move in March, and I carried successfully an orchid for eight hours, which was my housewarming gift a gesture to the building that was soon to become a community center for the people of Oakland to provide services, care, consolidation, education. I managed to maintain that orchid even as I was kettled by the police in the most terrifying situation I have ever been in at 19th and Telegraph. We were able to successfully free ourselves from that situation only to again be kettled and to be held hostage. But before, so my plant that I'd successfully carried was ripped out of my hands by the OPD, thrown to the ground and trampled. And just after that, they took the woman that I was standing there, they grabbed her, six men, took her down to the ground and beat her. And luckily someone pulled me back and I stood shocked like this, a bit as I am now, shaking in absolute disbelief. I was held hostage by the OPD for 54 hours, lost in a system. My name never, ever appeared. I was effectively disappeared, a missing person by the state. Now that we have a national defense bill that makes that actually legal, this is terrifying. When I got out finally on Tuesday, I thought I was free. I was so relieved. I spent the day at home. I thought I was free. I am shaking today because what I realize is outside is not free. This is not freedom. And if you confuse this with freedom, you do not understand how enmeshed in the prison that you are, that you can't discern the prison for what it is. This is not a sign that I am giving up. My emotion or shaking is not a sign that you have succeeded in breaking my spirit. It is a sign of emotional trauma that me and my community will help each other to deal with and we will come out stronger, more determined, full of love to free us all. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon to the members of the press. As you can see on my drum, Pastor Press, Peacekeeper Oscar Grant Plaza, Occupy Over. This weekend I became the first black pastor protecting sacred space 
which is for me was my church. When OPD came at two o'clock in the morning and arrested me and harassed me. They said no overnight lodging in the park. My citation that's in my pocket says I was arrested, booked into Alameda County Jail for loitering. I don't know. So basically, I'm asking the faith-based community. For me, this is African American History Month. I'm also Greek Indian. This ground that we sit on is a lonely land. It doesn't belong to the city. I was born here in a baby boom in 1957. I'm pushing 55 years old right now. I'm basically the oldest one out here that's giving guidance to these young people. I'm a community organizer who was proudly taught by Buna Jima, a boss. I organize, I fight, and to let the press know that particular door Friday, Saturday night, security officer left, walked from his post, left that door ajar. That's how that door got open. Because I was the second one in the city hall because I thought it was a press. OPD in this city cannot be trusted. I welcome all the faith-based community of Oakland to come down here. I have declared a Jericho. The Christians know what a Jericho is. On February 14th, which would be the third month anniversary we left this class of last year. I'm a peaceful person. I do not like violence anyway, ever. I think of Martin Luther King. That's when I think how OPD, and I'm a trimming. The reaction after that to the African American community is when me, being in fourth grade, witnessed how bad this police department was back in the 60s. Unfortunately, it has gotten worse. God bless you all. Yeah. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Yeah. M-O-N-I-Q-U-E. Monique. They call me Minister Mo on the streets. I am a certified preacher. Been in this thing from day one, from the outside to the inside. Born and raised in Oakland, California. Came down to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to this. I'm gonna make this sweet and simple. Those of you who have went to prison, God bless you. I feel for you. We heard the stories. We saw the broken hearts. We see it now. Let me say this, Occupy Oakland, we have been through this. We don't even get half of our belongings back. So you're pissed and angry, we've been pissed. We've been sitting in urine from day one. They throw our stuff in the banisters, they couldn't get it back. I'm a minister and I couldn't even get your things back because they put it in the banisters and they ran the banisters down and smashed our stuff. You think you're angry? We don't get our stuff back half the time. The third, the fourth camps that we camp in, that we sweat and we bleed for the occupied, and you talk against us when it's not all the occupied. We're here to see it. We eat, sleep, and drink it. We're not only claiming to be occupied, it's always going to stay. But baby, I'm about occupied Jesus. I'm about what we call ourselves now, the true diehards. The true diehards. I said, die hearts. We will die and bleed for Occupy. Will you do it? Will you come and feed us when we're hungry? Will you come and call us anymore? You have gotten out of the spirit. The spirit is still here. God made you suffer Drink. and go through this because Drink. you have forgotten who we Drink. are. You have forgotten who you are. The police is not the authority. It is God, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who died for your bodies. So remember, when you stand behind Occupy, stand behind the diehards who eat, sleep, and sleep on this ground. Remember, when your stuff gets taken, speak out, put it on YouTube, televise this mess. God bless Jesus, love y'all. Power to Occupy, yeah. Occupy. Yeah.
Um, I want to make it very clear that I speak for myself, not for the medic community, not for anyone else. Um, on Saturday, I witnessed some egregious offenses on behalf of OPD. I feel it's horrific that they decided to tear gas in the middle of the day on a Saturday in a residential area. Uh, I feel that being kettled both at 19th and Telegraph and then again in front of the YMCA with no point of egress was, again, unlawful and wrong. Um, it is my understanding that in 19th and Telegraph there was a declaration of unlawful assembly which does require a point of egress to be given and explained. Um, no such thing was done. I was not present for that declaration of unlawful assembly. I was, however, present in front of the YMCA where over 300 of us were wrongfully arrested, but no declaration of unlawful assembly was given there. We were instead told to submit to our arrest. Again, we were not given a point of egress. No unlawful assembly was declared. Had unlawful assembly been declared, many of us would have left. Had we been given a way to leave, many of us would have left. Instead, our civil rights were active, were violated. Um, it's very important to understand that OPD is taking these actions against us in an attempt to intimidate people not to exercise their First Amendment rights to assembly. It's very important to understand that as citizens of the United States, as patriotic Americans, we have a duty to speak out when our government is oppressing us. This country was founded on the principle of no taxation without representation. And the people of the United States no longer have that representation. It's instead in the hands of corporate lobbyists in Washington, D.C. It's very important to understand that when the police are allowed to behave in this manner, they are behaving in the interest of those corporations, of the corrupt city governments. And it's also very important to understand that Oakland is a city that is being driven into the ground by its government. It is criminal for a city administrator to make $275,000 a year when three schools are being shut down that could be sustained by her salary alone. It's criminal for a city to allow its police to behave in such a way that they lose millions of dollars every year in police brutality lawsuits. The city is hemorrhaging funds because their police force is being allowed to remain unchecked and it needs to stop. I personally am very disturbed by the fact that I find it necessary now to wear protective gear when treating people for first aid because I have been shown by experience that the police will hit you for daring to treat someone who is bleeding, for daring to treat someone who has been tear gassed, for daring to treat someone who has been shot in the neck with a bean background. I have no words to describe how angry it makes me that these things are being allowed to continue. It all needs to stop. People need to start occupying city council meetings, please. Come, speak, give your voice. I don't attend these actions as a protester, I attend them as a medic. My form of protesting is to go to city council and tell them that they are wrong and they need to stop this. And the more voices that come and speak out, the more likely we are to be heard. Please come speak out with us. Thank you.
Um, I feel like, I, you know, for years I battled with Pacific Care. That's why I, one of the main reasons I came here, you know, because they they denied medication, they refused to do stuff, just like, um, and City Hall didn't do anything. And they, could, they broke all kinds of agreements that I paid for and that I was powerless. And that's the same way I feel with the police. They can do whatever, they act lawlessly, they arrest us for their crime. It was just like um, when they said, you know, the, the banks got uh, bailed out, we got sold out. The police came and beat the shit out of us and we went to jail. And there's just, you know, and, the, and that's under our city council um, order. You know, and that's why I'm here in the first place because only the 1% and the powerful get represented. And I don't want any special treatment. I just want them to have to follow the same laws that I do. I get, pay, get like extra fines and late fees for every little thing, but they can do whatever they want. And it's just, there's something wrong with that. And when you guys like talk about what happened, you don't talk about the people here that, that are out here trying to make things better. You know, focusing on people throwing rocks when I got the shit beat out of me and denied medication and made fun of. And that happened both times I went to jail. And these are the only times I went to jail. And it was like, why did you go to jail? Oh, supporting campus. It's just stupid. It's ridiculous. So I, and oh, and let me tell you one more thing. The police, they, they harassed me. They pointed me out and said, come get me. Do I look dangerous to you guys? They follow me on Twitter. When they talk about all this money they spend, you know, how we're wasting all their money. Um, well, just think that they're deciding that they need to spend your tax dollars following me on Twitter. So, you know, it's just a waste and it's a joke and it needs to stop. So, thank you. Yeah.
What do you think he can do to avoid that? Yeah. 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 That violence comes from police. We don't have flash grenades. We don't have rubber bullets. We don't have anything to hurt anybody besides ourselves and our voice. And if that becomes a crime, then yes, we are fighting really hard because we talk and we walk and we do things to bring attention to the movement. Let me ask you, this poll, let's say it's accurate to some degree, how do you change public perception? Well, I think that we have to be a secure communication to businesses that support us who are by local liaison teams. We, we actually identify a way to affect the economy through our movement, and therefore we will gather better from the end of the week. I appreciate you taking time. Thank you. What businesses do you think are best to work? Retail, retail uh, uh, restaurants, uh, uh, anything uh, maybe manufacturing for the t-shirt or something. Uh, businesses that we can directly affect the economy so we can give people they don't know that this probably is uh, emotional, they can identify with the economy. We have a lot of donors. And what would they do? They would donate their yeah, food? And they would know. The donor, they, they, would, they would go to the business and they would support them with the business and decide how they would like it. Would it be through products? It would be through a logo. I could actually show them a logo. Hey, excuse me. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm live streaming, and I was wondering if you want to be interviewed or just talk some more at all. Or can I ask you sure. about your history? All right. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I was really moved. So so hi. Now you're on the screen. <laughs> My name is uh, Arthur Martinez. Most people know me by Eloy or E for short. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been involved. I got started in the movement in 1957 with Corky Gonzalez and the Crusade for Justice in Denver, Colorado, when uh, police were really coming down on Latinos and people of, you know, I'm mixed. I'm an Indian and uh, mixed mestizo. And, uh, I got, uh, when I came to California, economic reasons, because Colorado was a little low paced state. When I came to California, I got involved with uh, Cesar Chavez and farm workers and a nonviolent movement. And then uh, in 1969, 1969 I, well, in, 19, 19, in the early 60s, in Arvin and Delano, the police and the sheriff's department, highway patrol set their dogs on us, and the police actually rode their horses into the crowd. And these are mostly farm worker people that were there. And there was a lot of union organizing and stuff going on. And, uh, and in, in 1969, uh, we started a Chicano school in Berkeley, which is an alternative school. My wife, uh, Dr. Salmurillo, a few other people, he wasn't a doctor then, but he actually got his doctorate and his PhD. Uh, they, we started a Chicano Indian school. And uh, at that same time, Black Panther organization, I live in East Oakland, by the way, Deep East, what they call it, Deep East. Or probably part of the 100 blocks that they're targeting right now. Uh, and uh, in 1969, I met Richard Oakes and some of the students. I was going to UC Berkeley at that time. I had a leadership training program. It was funded by one of the big corporations, Ford. But it was, I guess maybe they were studying how my already sink. I don't remember. But it, it, I was one of 37 Bay Area Union people that went to that program. And I had met Richard Oakes at a Vietnam rally demonstration. And he told, we were sitting there, and uh, my wife, his kids actually were playing my son. And they came over, and uh, my son came over and said, hey, Mark, do you have a sandwich? And I looked at this kind of big guy over there, you know, and, uh, his name was Richard Oakes. At the time, I didn't know who he was. And he didn't know me, so. But anyway, I looked at him, and I, you know, I just, so he's like, is this okay? And he said, yes. So when he came over and introduced himself, we got to talk. And he told me, one of the Chicanos realize that, wouldn't realize that they're Indians. <laughs> and I said, maybe about the same time everybody else does. <laughs> but anyway, we became friends. And he asked me, 
you know, about going on Alcatraz, but that's what the Hunt Brothers were going to take over on operation and stuff. And then, I, maybe I was probably invited to because I had a Volkswagen bus and I carried a lot of people. So I was like, kind of like a taxi. Mm -hmm. But I, I helped occupy island and to, uh, for the last 27 years I still do the fire on the sunrise ceremony. They're on the fire. After Alcatraz, I got involved a lot of other things. I eventually went down to the Inner Tribal Friendship House. I was a director there for a few years. Actually, about six years. I was there probably longer than any other director. But we helped bring the place back. Me and a lot of other people, not just Native American people, you know, those white people that, that were extremely helpful doing all that stuff for us. So, I've been involved with the uh, Protect the Sacred Sites in Emeryville. And, uh, at, on April the 7th of 2003, I was in Fort Oakland demonstrating peacefully. I got shot in the leg. I was one of the people that the city of Oakland uh, settled with. And uh, every time that there's something that, that has to be done, I think I, I, I need to be kind of like on the forefront because I, I think that, uh, you know, I'm, by the way, I'm 71 years old and I'm, I'm, I'm living on one leg. I got to carry that, that shield for the Oakland Occupy thing, the one that said, uh, cops move out. I saw the that one. one. was not confiscated. I got to carry it pretty much until we got to the to Laney College. And then when they started running up around the hill, I just can't keep up with one day because I got the stay still bumping me. I got shot in Oakland. But uh, I was on the other side of the building. We were part of that group that went on the other side of the building before the police came there. And as soon as they heard a big roar of noise from the crowd. I guess they assumed that something was happening so they came charging back along there. And that's when they, they said that somebody had started something. They started shooting the gas, they first started shooting the, the gas grenades and the flash grenades. Right. And then after that, they charged, they kind of corralled people and we were on, uh, at that time, we were right at the back end of the Kaiser building and they started shooting and uh, one of the fences, because they were blocking off, everybody they were starting, to, I guess, with the, I like that word, the S, kettling. Uh, they started doing that, people started moving away. So some of the group that said, you know, if, if you don't want to really be up in the front, you know, the people that had shields and stuff, which I'm glad they were there because I think they protected a lot of women and children. But we were chased up, Actually not chased, we kind of moved out, and then uh, we were walking on pretty close to open Devon uh, Avenue, I think it was, and uh, the police charge started to run. People started to run to get away from us, and some of the people that were they were retreating. All these people were retreating. None of them was confronting the police. All the confrontation was way on the other end. This, they, 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 because they had said peaceful people who don't want to be involved in other kind of stuff like this. You know, with the flash grenades are going off, you need to get it back. So most. And then what we were doing was kind of trying to hold the intersections to keep the police from getting to a lot of other people. But in any case, uh, when we, the people were retreating, I seen several women on bicycles and some that were walking trying to retreat to get away from the scene, not doing anything, not throwing nothing, just moving backwards, and they were beat with batons. Bad. I mean, they, it wasn't like co-cubit of gun, it was quacking, it was wailing. But I, I was lucky I didn't get arrested. Uh, kind of thankful. I don't really like jail. Uh, but I'm just so glad that all of the youth, you know, like I've been to marches and rallies, and I've never seen a lot of these people. You know, today I'm seeing the people because I think that it's necessary, not just for the people of color to get up and say this or that. And, you know, we all know how the police are. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we've had first-hand experience pretty much most of us. Mm -hmm. So, but to see them turn on their own, you know, these are mostly, most of the cops are, are, are white people, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but to see them turn on their own people, you know, these are, these are white kids that are going to be the future leaders of America, you know? How can you do that? You have to. You guys act like you have Thanks for sharing your story. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
just the whole thing. It was a really good night for today. Thank you. I slipped it up one word and it like five minutes how we feel. We feel so protective of the oh, oh no. No, no, okay. <laughs> no we, you're out there and you just feel so protective of the young people because you've been through this stuff and you just and you know they're doing the right thing and all you can do is just everything you can to support them. That's why Eloy's out here in his family. <laughs> well, I just think it like I, I just can't believe people have been focused on vandalism. Like they have higher expectations of their, you know, activist allies or something. I just think if I was ever brutalized you're by a police very officer, very God help me if I don't respond violently. I mean, I don't believe in violence. I also don't believe in vandalism, but I understand that other people strategically do. Okay, so what are we looking at? Yeah, the farm workers. I was giving Jimmy Bradley what is worth it. Well, I guess I have another question. Um, like in, the, I'll, I'll just keep videoing you. But um, in December, there was a I came to tell proposal this to the General no Assembly to um, change the name of Occupy Oakland to Decolonize Oakland. Do you, or, do you know much about that? Uh, no, I don't know too much about it because uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that uh, we have to decolonize anything because this land still belongs to the Native Americans and none of the treaties, are, even they're talking about unratifying the treaties, they never ratified them. So how can they non-ratify something that was never done? I mean, it's the same old mix that they give us today, just in a different form. And, uh, you know, I, I personally think that most of the federal people are training the police departments to do what they do. Mm -hmm. They don't learn that on their own. We, we I, spotted a colonel from the Department Department of Homeland Security here today. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the, they're all around. Yeah. I mean, that's never, that's never, you know, our, when we were on uh, on Alcatraz, you know, uh, there was a lot of, you know, people <laughs> burned things down over there. They accused the engines of doing that. Why would the engines do that against their own best interest? You know, negative. Thing that doesn't do but get you negative. Yeah. And that's what they're trying to pose. That's what they're trying, they're trying today to make us look like we're negative out here. We're it's not a, negative out here. Yeah. You know, this is about positive energy and this is about change. Mm -hmm. I and mean, real change. But you know, it's, they're not going to listen until the young people mm -hmm. make them listen. Mm -hmm. You know, take it to the polls. The people you don't like, get them out of all this. You know, I mean, if they can target people, why can't we target them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? So, d were you around much during the times of the tent camp in the plaza? I came a few times and supported. You know. Did you? What can you describe what you saw going on? Uh, I seen uh, probably one of the, when the, the first time that they started running the kids down San Pablo Avenue when they were taking over uh, one of the buildings down there. That was uh, that was right after I think the port shutdown, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. uh, I was here. They had a whole. Anyway, I have a, I'm a 70-year-old motorcycle rider, and I bought one of the giant shirts that said, I love Occupy Oakland, put it right in front of my bike. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, and I'm going um, to sign off right now. Thanks for sharing your thank story. You.